Hey, fellow babies, it's Ukraine Update here on the shills, and what else can you say to start this show? But to my cousins to the south, the United States of America, welcome back to the table. Way to go, all you people who were able to put aside pie part or partisan politics and get it done. Awesome, awesome news. We've got a really great thing going on here today because we've got two awesome guests joining us. So we've got Secular Sakai as always. We've got Yana from Project Constantine, Commander McMillan, retired U.S. Um, man of mastery when it comes to knowing what the heck's going on. Maybe not in his own life, but when it comes to the situation in Ukraine, he's got it. And so the first of our guests here, we've got Yulia. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for inviting me. So I guess give this the... Is a good, good, sorry? Yeah, I was going to say, I guess this is a good time to introduce myself, right? <laughs> yeah, give give us a rundown, you know, uh, your actions, your uh, what you're doing on YouTube and everything, oh. and we'll get every you'll get your link shilled in the live chat, so everybody goes over to sub. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, hi, I'm Yulia. I'm Ukrainian. I've lived in New York for the past 13 years until I decided to move back to Ukraine three months ago. And now I live in Kyiv. And um, I uh, have been doing reporting in Ukraine since basically the beginning of the full scale invasion. That was like a 180 turn on my life because I was a, you know, a, a regular UX designer in New York City, as everyone is in New York City. And <laughs> and then I started getting a lot of very, very ignorant messages from my uh, friends that I love very, very much. And a friend of mine suggested I record a video explaining geopolitics and history uh, around the war and put it up on TikTok, at which point I was like, I'm 27 years old. I TikTok. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> and uh, lots of people had lots of questions. And uh, I guess the questions never stopped coming, and so I'm here to answer them. And I work with United24 and Svidami Media and a bunch of other Ukrainian news outlets, and I'm currently working on a project of my own to sort of um, reconstruct the way that news is being presented to Western audiences uh, in English from Ukraine, because I think there is lots coming in here without context, which very often hurts Ukraine more than it helps. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Cool. Well Pretty said, good. too. Excellent. And we've got Jake Bro joining us as well today. So uh, I'm sure you all actually know Jake Bro. I mean, come on, you don't. You, not everybody has their head in the sand like a big tall bird trying to hide. But uh, Jake, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the show, and you know, give everybody a little buzz on what you're up to and who you are and stuff. Thanks for having me, Dick. Uh, if there's anyone who doesn't know who I am, I'm a former nuclear missile operations officer with the United States Air Force. I separated from the Air Force in February of 2022, the exact same week as the full-scale invasion. I happened to have a YouTube channel with about 80,000 subscribers. I was talking about other stuff, but I just wanted to give my opinion, and the video did very well. So I made another one and another one, and... Here we are two years later, and <clears throat> I'm still making a video more or less every other day uh, in support of Ukraine. Excellent. Excellent. Speaking of in support of Ukraine, shout out here because here at the Shills, along with the Portuguese battalion of the NAFO 69 Sniffing Brigade, we've got a NAFO truck sponsor or uh, fundraiser going on right now. I Usually I can speak, so I think it will settle in for me in a minute here, but... Uh, our mods will be dropping the link in the chat right now so you can uh, run on over and help us support and, you know, help get another one of these vehicles out to some heroes that need it. Um, the campaign's going well and it can always go better. And we appreciate all of the support and help on this that we can get. So big fundraiser from us going on right now as well. And I think we should turn right to our guests and get to the vote. Right. So uh, ladies first, I guess, Yulia, the uh, the vote, um, the Americans are back to the table. They're going to be joining us for some cake at the party and tossing in big gifts. Right. What do you think? 
Uh, well, hey, I mean, provided that I've lived in the U.S. for 13 years, I feel like I'm a half American in, the, in that matter. So I feel like half of me was at the table and half of me is now allowed back at the table. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm very uh, honestly exhilarated to see this pass. I really hope that uh, the Senate is going to pass it as well, though I have no doubt on it. And I do think that Biden is going to sign it that same day which I would say puts the timeline on about Tuesday for the final, you know, final approval. And given that there have been quite a few reports that there are lots of weapons already waiting and they're ready to go and they would be delivered in a matter of days. And also through my personal contacts, I've heard some information. I think that by Friday, Russia is going to have quite a few, quite a few troubles <laughs> at the front line. Although, I mean, there is a lot, you know, it, it's been a very long time and there are a lot of troubles that we are facing at the front line. So um, I wouldn't expect, you know, this is like a very happy moment and everyone is cheering. And I feel like everyone is going to expect some like large action and something major to happen. But that's not, you know, we need to we need to recover from everything that's been happening first. Very much so. Jake, bro, uh, what, what are your initial thoughts? Uh, any reactions from yourself there? The final vote was like 311 to 100 something. Uh, it, it was three to one. Seventy three percent of members of Congress voted in favor of this aid package, despite everything Russia has done to confuse people, misinformation. Uh, so, yeah, it was clearly a supermajority and this minority, no Democrats voted against it. So it's this minority of Republicans that mm -hmm. held this up for seven months. Funding officially expired on October 1st of last year. Everyone that unnecessarily died, Ukrainian defenders, civilians, due to lack of air defenses. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm 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 going to lay off Speaker Johnson in my videos because he did the right thing in the end. But I'm not going to forget what these people did, and I hope Americans don't forget come November. Well said, man. Uh, yeah. Commander McMillan, um, do you see any pitfalls? Was there any sort of language in there that you caught that was maybe a warning sign, or is it looking really honest? It, at first glance, I think it's it's fairly honest, and I think it's done what it is. I, I think it's pretty clear that you know the the twenty five percent of the Republican or the 25% that didn't vote for it, that half of the Republican Party maggot group. Um, I think they're marching to a very different drummer, and I think that drummer is playing sheet music that came out of the Kremlin. <laughs> uh, I did like the fact that uh, as soon as it passed, you know, there was a lot of cheering and celebration in there and a lot of people waving you. Ukrainian flags down on the floor of the house. So it shows that uh, the support is, I think, honest and legitimate. Um, I'm hoping that the logisticians have been at work prior to this so that the moment this thing is signed into law, they can already have aircraft in the air moving the, uh, the high value cargo to get there to bolster the air defenses as quickly as possible. Uh, I also like the fact that Zelensky had his thank you message that was released like minutes after the vote. So that's, that's a good thing too. Mm. Um, yep. Yena, our regular from project Constantine, what was the thoughts? I know, uh, you and Olia were just, you know, having a little WhatsApp party as it came through, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, we were having fun. Um, and then also at the same time on the Project Constantine uh, group chat, we were going off there as well. Um, and uh, it was quite funny because Helena was also on there and she was like, uh, can you guys, can someone please talk, change the conversation into Ukrainian? Because I understand English, but you're talking political lingo and I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, someone from, we have a volunteer from Canada, Hussein Supplies, and he was just like, no one understands Washington language. So. <laughs> we sure shall <laughs> don't. Yeah. Um, so no, we were uh, really glad. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's especially, you know, um, for myself and for Olya as well. I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, 
very important for us because we uh, see it like it involves us directly. I mean, Oya's brother has been um, part of the Zesu since 2014. Um, so, you know, it affects her directly. It is also for me with Pete and our our team. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's really difficult when um, we see that. I mean, um, like last week, um, you played that video of um, the Ukrainian soldier who passed away. Yeah. Um, I asked Pete, like, what was the circumstances? And he said, no, he um, died um, in the trench, but Russia attacked all the wounded with drones. And they executed them, all of them, with drones. Wow. Um, And that's how he died. Because he couldn't be retrieved. He couldn't, Mm -hmm. that's how he died. So this aid is, if it if it passes, it's on such a tangible level that we can, you know, at least save lives and get it back out. Yeah, push back to some original borders as well here, you know, yeah, yeah. like start making a difference. Yeah. And what do you big- think in there, Sakai? You know, what's your opinion on all this? My thoughts, uh, I was ecstatic when I saw that it passed. I was in the middle of the stream, actually. Uh, and I've had a lot of messages from people uh, who have been, uh, I don't know, just uh, literally calling the representatives months on end, uh, doing going from all the different angles, calling uh, Speaker Johnson directly at all of his office lines in D.C. and Louisiana. Um, so a lot of people I know we're very happy and celebrating. I can tell you that I already know a lot of those people are already planning what their next steps are to get mm, even more to Ukraine from grassroots mm. efforts or just in terms of uh, further um, outreach, you know, making sure support stays strong because uh, this is going to be very helpful. But of course, it's far, you know, it's far from over. We still got a long ways to go, unfortunately. Yeah, you're not wrong there, unfortunately. But, um, um, oh, perfect timing here. We've got Greg Terry in, the most unbelievably successful fundraiser the world has ever seen, and a man who stands at the pulpit preaching with some serious <laughs> iron in his hand. Thank you, Dick Dawson, and uh, I apologize deeply for being uh, 25 minutes tardy. That is never my intention, but I uh, was watching the and dealing with the vote there with uh, Professor Gertis, and we're, we we talk every day and work together daily. And then Johnny said, man, get on my channel real quick. Let's talk about it. I said, I got to be at the Shields at three. And when Johnny starts waxing eloquent on ATP geopolitics, and uh, that's what happens, but uh, yeah, we're here and just like to say hello to Yana and Yulia and Commander McMillan and uh, Sekla Sakai and Jake Bro. Nice to meet you, sir. Awesome. So, well, yeah, we were doing thoughts on the mm-hmm. whole bill pass and what's going on and whatnot. So, uh, you know, let it out. What, well, what- I'm just I'm very happy. This is a morale booster today. I've spoken with some Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines uh, who are smiling because if you do not think they're watching this, they do. They have great access to C-SPAN and <laughs> they're watching it. And as, as much as, as it is important for the supply that will take place, and, and this is not a panacea nor the F-16s, but this is a massive boost here, a massive oh, yeah. morale boost. Uh, we got soldiers smiling today. Our team's been dropping aid over the last 10 days on all the frontline positions and been in the hottest places, uh, Chasiv Yard or Boltney, all of those, uh, the cranky guys, and uh, morale has not been the best over the last few weeks just due to the attrition of war. But this mm. today, it will be a big morale booster. Additionally, mm. it also is a statement to the world. I also think that there's much more to this than uh, meets the mind uh, because there's a lot of things happening uh, geopolitically that are connected with this. And so I, I'm sure Jake laid it out. I watch Jake's videos every day, uh, and I appreciate how he lays out his commentary. So it passed the the House, and now it has to go through the Senate. And, of course, we fully expect that to pass there. And then pa- the, the president has to sign it. And then 
it becomes law and away it goes. So there's some really good things there. I have told people today, everybody, when I was with Johnny, was wanting to start dividing. Well, uh, Sparks voted against it. Well, da 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 da. I said, guys, leave all of that alone. The, the Stop, time yeah. will tell step by step. Things will come out. Why people do what they do. Forget all that. Go get a pizza and a Pepsi Cola and enjoy <laughs> a victory. A jo enjoy no, today no, where this yeah. is not about Democrats and Republicans, but this no. is about Americans uh, coming together and finally doing what's right. Greg, and, Greg I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm preaching, man. I, I, go, I, I completely agree with you. Ex oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Sakai, you've got that <laughs> bad gonna... latency again, gonna... dude. You've got to rejoin. You're like way behind us. I can tell now. Yeah, yeah. So while he's rejoining, just so, okay, so I, that's I'm really good. My phone. So that's really good. So now what happens? I also believe there's a deep connection because in that bill there was an amendment that was uh, stating that those uh, the responsible parties connected to the Chinese government that own TikTok have 12 months to get rid of it or yeah. to relinquish their authority over that, or it would be banned in the U.S. And that amendment passed. And I just see a lot of connection here between Ukraine, between Israel and Iran, and between what is happening in Asia as well. And for me, on all three fronts today, this is great, great news. Now what we need is for the European Union to continue doing what they're doing. We need Poland to get their border fixed. And we need Ukraine now to follow through on their mobilization. And I believe now the mobilization will become much clearer, although President Zelensky will be signing off on it in May. But there's been a lot of morale struggle internally inside Ukrainian uh, leadership there in the military due to the due to the mobilization and specifically the demobilization. But now that Ukraine is seeing, hey, we're, we're starting to get some swing behind us again. I think that'll wash out. And this is going to turn out to be really, really good for Ukraine. Sermon over. <laughs> yes go ahead oh, i'm done we uh, we don't we don't no, hear you yeah. yulia are you muted uh-oh please don't tell me there's something wrong <laughs> hey i heard that so we can hear snippets but we can't hear you oh no i hear you dick okay so she might have to rejoin um, um, the the service in the background. Yana, you want to tell her to rejoin? The service in the background is giving out yeah, these yellow flashes. Us. She can okay. hear us, so she's yeah. going to rejoin. The, the whole, it's freaking out on her. I could just see it going really bad. I hope it's not one of those days. Uh, let's turn to Jake here because uh, Greg dropped a lot there and it was very much in your wheelhouse, right? I, I want to emphasize to people... This is a victory today. We, sh we should celebrate, but uh, we also have to start preparing for the next aid package, hopefully that we can get passed in December or January. Just because we're passing this today doesn't mean we're good for the next right. 12 months. Yeah, this what, is definitely not a panacea. What, what, what MAGA did is they stalled for seven months. They blocked this for seven months. And this $60 billion was supposed to be for the calendar year, October to October of this year. So Biden and the DOD, they can start doubling up these aid packages if they want. You know, they're basically going to be sending, they're going to announce aid packages worth maybe $3 billion every two weeks or whatever. But we're not, we're not, we're not going to tolerate losing $30 billion over half a year in what should have been sent to Ukraine to help them fight this war. So right. I just want to emphasize that we're not good for the next 12 months. We lost half a year. We have to make up for lost time. I know there's nothing's going to happen before the November election, but perhaps in the lame duck session, maybe between like Christmas and New Year's, we can pass another aid package. Depending on who wins the presidency, uh, if Trump wins, there might be some urgency to get it done before he's sworn in. But if Biden wins, they can wait till January and they can do this again. Right. We definitely are behind the curve. I completely agree with, with Jake there because the delay, it, it trickles down, guys, all the way to the front, all the way. And um, it, it, it has caused a delay. So, yeah, it, it, you're not going to just wake up tomorrow and everything's hunky-dory. But um, from the Ukrainian side, it, definitely a hopeful day that we're getting the ship turned around. Now we have to play catch-up. Is there... 
Now, um, let's address another side of this. Is there now a concern that Russia's just going to go flat out as crazy as they can to try to inflict as much damage and stuff as they can before this becomes a reality with equipment on the ground and stuff? I mean, if you just look at what's been going on um, this past three, four days um, with the air raid sirens in Kiev and Odessa and Kharkiv, they've been going crazy. Yesterday and the day before in Odessa, it was all day. Um, and Yulia is rejoining, but um, she'll tell you about Kiev as well. It's just consistent. And usually, I mean, they stick to, you know, doing it at nighttime. But um, Odessa is now, it's during the day, and I have the air alerts turned on for Odessa because that's where Halina lives. And I'm getting the, it's constant. Yesterday it was cons constant. So it's really, it feels like they've decided like they're gonna they're gonna attack as many civilians as possible um, until the aid comes in, and specifically the Patriot um, systems come in. Right. Um, that's what it what it feels like. You know, I know where we're stationed at the moment. Um, it's not that active a section of the front line, um, but previously we were um, in Chasifiar, and. That was terrible. But where mm. we're at now, um, it's not that active of a section. Um, but we are we are about like seven kilometers away from the front. And it is, um, it does seem a bit more quiet, but I mean, you can still hear it in the background. Okay. Um, oh, we had somebody back, but now they've just popped out again. I hope that sorts. I really do. Um, um, oh, a big shout out there to Georgie from uh, Ukraine Matters. He gave us a shout out and sent some people over to come and check out the show today. So big shout out there. Thank you. Thank you. One of the good guys. Oh, the good guy. Absolutely, absolutely sure. for sure. Whoa, that's an Whoa, echo. Oh, that's an echo. Hold on. Okay. 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 Maybe that solved it. Okay. All right. Okay, so we've got her back in. Hold on. Let me just get the hexagon thing stored in. So I think we can hear you now, too, Yulia. I think you're back on property. Hi. All right. Yes. Yeah, we were actually yeah, well, just talking about, um, and I was like, oh, it's bad that you're not here. But we were talking about whether or not um, um, it looks like Russia will speed up their attacks and be more brutal until the aid arrives. And I know the air raid sirens have been a bit worse this past week or so i mean air raid sirens have been worse in general i don't think it necessarily has a lot to do with the aid i think um well russia started ruining ukrainian infrastructure i think it has to do with lack of aid right because we for instance like the the reason why tripilla uh, power plant was ruined is because we only had seven shells out of 11 necessary to take down 11 russian missiles so we took down seven and then the rest of them unfortunately went through so they ruined the power plant and i think that russia and like these things take months to prepare right so i don't think they're they can just like out of the wazoo started Attacking Ukraine more than they were. I think that this has been, uh, this has been prepped way in advance, and this is done uh, not necessarily like because the aid has passed, but they're trying to do as much damage as they can until we can actually, until we can actually defend ourselves. So that's yeah. for certain something that's been happening. Well, I think another thing to be considered the, is that as soon as the pay package passed, they know they're now under a time crunch deadline before munitions start arriving. So they're going to redouble their efforts while they still have a chance of getting stuff through. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm sure that they were planning on sort of like redoubling their efforts at this time, at this time around sort of anyway, because again, we're lacking ammo, we're lacking air defense, we're lacking everything. And they know it's their golden moment. They can't necessarily produce more in a short span of time, right, or prepare more in a short span of time. So this has definitely been pre planned whether aid was going to pass or wasn't going to pass. It's just sort of their golden, like golden window of opportunity. 
Hey, Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Sure. Um, we've got a couple introductions to do. Our brother Starsky's made it. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Starsky. How are you guys? I missed you. I'm, I'm really sorry about being a bit late, but um, uh, I was uh, doing whatever we always do on the West here, which is plotting evil plot against Russia, because this is what <laughs> we always plot uh, evil plots against Russians, planning how to kill them. That's why they have to invade other countries all the time. Uh, yeah, but guys, I'm really, really happy to see you. I missed you like crazy, and I'm really happy to see you that you're uh, all doing fine. And uh, Jake Bro is here. Hello, hello, buddy. It's been a while. Hi, Starsky. I missed you. Uh, yeah, I missed you too, bro. <laughs> Greg, uh, What's up, Commander, brother? Dick, uh, Yana, and uh, Secular Sakai. And, uh, and uh, hello, hello. Yulia. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very nice to see you too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, Hi. uh, yeah, Starsky. Um, um, what do you think? The vote's going through. It looks like everything. You know, we everybody got to sound off on that. So right to you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is something we were uh, expecting and anticipating. Unfortunately, it took uh, such a long while, almost uh, six, six, mo six months, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of territory lost and what's uh, even more... Um, a tragic uh, a lot of lives lost unfortunately due to the hesitation uh, and uh, we all see the price of this hesitation uh, but uh, now we have a chance now uh, I can tell you what our guys are talking about in the uh, monitoring channels here here on the telegram I'm talking about Ukrainian monitor monitoring channels basically they say that uh, the the bill passed the Russia is effed big time, uh, but uh, still, I think there are a couple stages uh, that a uh, couple steps that should be made in order to receive this aid. Hopefully, everything will be fine. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I sort ahead. of wanted to yeah. add. To I think that the biggest the biggest thing that will help the, the biggest thing that this package accomplishes is morale boost because you could see this uh, around Ukrainian civilians and also Ukrainian military right while we sort of felt like the US was going to just like drop us and we were going to have to figure out what to do and Ukraine is never planning on giving up right like we're not if for us it's not an option so it's sort of like I think a lot of military and a lot of civilians were sort of at a loss of what to think and what to do because we know Know we can't give up but we know without us aid we're kind of fucked right mm. so it's one of those things where i think that it, obviously the the most important thing is what's in the package but i think on top of that this is going to screw russia even more because now the spirits of the defenders the people at the front and volunteers and just the population in general are going to sort of level out there is going to be less discord and discourse in society and more and and everything is just sort of going to go a little bit uphill at least because of that because we've been having a lot of issues with that for sure I want to I want to add that it's not just a morale boost for Ukrainian forces, but this is also demoralizing for anyone dumb enough to support Russia. I'm looking at these tweets, for example, from Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, who's been uh, promoting Russian talking points this entire time. And for people like Marjorie, for people like Tucker Carlson, people like Elon Musk, everything they've been doing the last six months to make sure this vote never happened, they just got defeated. And I hope, you know, they're going to bed tonight thinking all that time and effort wasted. Russia is incompetent. When you actually get out a ruler and measure in the Avdika direction, they've only gone 14 kilometers in two years. Hundreds of thousands dead. The United States wasn't even helping Ukraine the last mm. six months. And the Russian ground forces in the Avdika direction have gone 14 kilometers in two years. They're incompetent. Russia's <laughs> never going to win. And I think people who, they're not really pro-Russian, they're just anti-American. That's it. But they're going to realize this and they're going to say, I'd, I'd rather watch Dancing with the Stars with my time or whatever, because <clears throat> rooting for Russia is a losing cause. Stars yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would also, uh, I would also like to add one thing, that, and I'm talking a lot about it. Uh, by the way, <laughs> Marjorie, she's so, she, she's so funny, like... 
she wanted to stop uh, the aid for Ukraine so bad that she was ready to change uh, Johnson, like to to you know to remove him. It's, yeah. it's insane. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but one thing, uh, you know, about people who support Ukraine, uh, they are so much stronger because they are ready to fight and ready to sacrifice and uh, ready to support, which is more important. You know, people who are anti-Ukrainian and anti-American, their whole uh, uh, rhetorics are based on, I will not spend my money on Ukraine, which also means they will not spend their money on Russia either. They they're just not doing anything. You know, they're they're useless. Uh, which which is not bad for us because if they don't support Russia, then the only uh, people, the only allies Russia can rely on are such uh, beautiful uh, countries like Iran, Syria, North Korea. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why Ukraine will win. One, more than 140 countries support Ukraine around the world. I think, Starsky, and see what your thought is on this, but I think this actually will have the biggest benefit. For, forget the aid right now, but I think morally and for uh, a real boost in the arm for mobilization. We know President Zelensky is to sign in May the new mobilization bill. We know that internally inside uh, Ukrainian higher ups in the military, some guys are a little uh, anti due to the demobilization issues. But in general, this is going to have a very positive turn for mobilization, realizing now that, hey, we're going to be looking at some supplies for guys who are being mobilized. I was in the taxi just a few weeks ago in Khmelnytsky, driving around, guys 44 years old, and I'm speaking to him in Russian, and we're just going back and forth, da -da 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 -da. and I asked him, point, really nice guy. And um, I said, man, I I'll try to speak Ukrainian to you, but my Russian's much better. He goes, no, no problem. Let's, let's have a chat. So we're talking, and I said, so uh, you're going to go fight for your country? You're going to sit here and drive a taxi? And he, he looked at me point blank. He says, I want to go fight for my country, but my brother is on the zero in Chasivyar. My father is down uh, in Orykiv, and my uncle is over in Kharkiv. And all three of my family members said, do not go for mobilization yet because we have very small supply and we want you to live. And he point blank told me, he goes, if supply will come, I will go straight and sign up myself. But my own family's telling me not to. I believe now that will have a huge boost uh, with a transition for morals uh, or, or or the morale uh, with soldiers now and, and recruiting and, and increasing the fighting forces of Ukraine. Th this is a win-win-win um, all the way around. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I want to echo something. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. I'll, yeah. I'll speak after. Um, also, Prof. Gerdes is in the chat. So, Hi. Um, and he says Marjorie's using this bill to enhance her profile, um, which I think is an interesting thing. Well, and, she's uh, really starting to look like a headless chicken, so it's working. Yeah. And um, yeah, then Julia. Well, you. Professor Gerdes is as uh, conservative as, as I am. We're very, very similar, similar age, similar background, actually grew up in similar cities and uh uh, but I'll tell you this, the other day we were streaming and uh, he got so mad at Marjorie Taylor Greene and this is the shills. So I can let my hair gold. down a little yeah. bit on the shills. Um, but he, he says, you know what? Uh, I'm not calling her Marjorie Taylor Greene anymore. I'm calling her a camera whore. And I, <laughs> I said, Professor Gertis. <laughs> uh, so no, yeah. I'm not letting you live that one down, prof. Oh, no but way. No you, way. Yeah, what did you say? Well, I wanted to echo something that Jake Bro said, actually, through the words of a Ukrainian defender that recently uh, that was recently killed in action, Pavlo Petrushenko. He had this interview that's been uh, going viral in Ukraine, and there is a particular clip from it because that's something that I really agree with, and I think. Um, we've all been trying to communicate, right? That in the past like six months, Russian propaganda has been working very, very hard. And the fact that Ukraine without 
basically any reasonable aide or any sizable aide was able to hold down our positions shows a lot. And that he was saying that he sees that everyone's morale is falling and that everyone is ready to like sort of, you know, like their their hands are dropping and no one wants to really do anything because we feel like we're not being supported. But this is part of it. And then we just need to wait it out. And then once we wait out this like super, super rough moment, then then the, it's kind of like, you know, there is always light at the end of the dark tunnel. Yeah. And I think that that's the best summary of what he was saying. And I think that that echoes what Jake was saying and what Starsky was saying as well. And also, I think it's something important to mention because um, in on, in memory of Pablo Potrashenko, who was actually, um, today was his funeral uh, at the, in Kyiv. And it was, you know, it's a very sad event for, for a lot of people in this country. Yeah. yeah. I know um, when he, <clears throat> when he was killed, um, my friend Olya, you actually know Olya, Yulia, um, you made that video about her tweet, yeah. And um, she told me uh, that Russians think it's a general they killed because of the reaction on Ukrainian Twitter. And she said, but she told me, she's like, she doesn't think there's a general in Ukraine who would have, who would, whose death would cause this reaction in Ukrainian civilization, like in the Ukrainian society. Um, yeah, Pavel Petrashenko was a very important figure, I think, to both civilians and military. He was very, very outspoken, very well spoken. He, uh, he kind of, you know, with no filter and very few words would really tell the real situation the way that it is. And he was able to appeal to both like English speaker and Ukrainians. And usually that's a very different information sphere. And you focus on one or the other because it's kind of different methods of discouraging are used on different groups of people. And usually if you are trying to kind of, you know, not get yourself into a mess where your hands are down mm. in the Ukrainian information sphere, you kind of either focus on trying to combat the foreign propaganda or you're trying to combat like Ukrainian issues. And he was very good at, at sort of figuring out both. And I think a lot of people looked up to him. Good call. Um, um, yeah, and I wanted to uh, add mm. one thing here. Uh, of course, we all saw how Ukrainians meet their fallen heroes. Uh, they go outside their city when the body is being delivered to, to, the, to the hometown of a, a soldier. They go outside 100 kilometers away from the city or a village. Uh, they're standing on their knees and they're uh, meeting their hero back home. Uh, we will, of course, never see that in Russia because, like, who cares about people in Russia, guys? And um, today I found, like, this very interesting uh, screenshot from Russian media, uh, and uh, it's uh, from a, a um, community in Tver, uh, Tverskaya Oblast of the Terrorist Federation. Uh, so, 17th of April, uh, there was a message uh, in Tverskaya Oblast, uh, a 64-year-old private who died uh, in the special military operation will be buried. And then they say Pantelei Alexandrovich Bukalov was born on 8th of August 1959, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 29th of January this year, he was uh, recruited uh, on a contract um, as a private, as a rifleman. 25th, 2020, 2024, which basically less than, uh, less than two months, uh, he died during the special military operation. And uh, 19th of April, uh, there was this... Uh, uh, the, the, this burial, the, this funeral. So basically the lifespan of a uh, Russian mobilized Russian uh, contract soldier is approximately like two, uh, two months, something like that, because they wow. don't really care. They, they just send as many... Uh, Untrained know, donkeys, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the record was something like six days. The dude was recruited. Um, it was, I think, last year. The dude was recruited, uh, not recruited, the mo mobilized. 
right six days uh, it's it was without any tra like the dude was literally recruited into the army given a rifle and a uniform six days he's dead wow uh, which is a great record uh, <laughs> in my i'll agree with you there um i've gotta i gotta hit a button here now now it's time to get a story from a guest and uh, Jake, I wanted to turn to you here because if I'm right, you were a launch officer for ballistic missiles for a time. Now, when I, when I hear that, I'm thinking Hollywood. You're one of the guys that puts the key in and has to turn with the other guy across the room, right? But what's the reality of this? No, you're absolutely correct. If you've ever seen like a Cold War movie where people have to turn keys at the same time to launch a nuclear weapon, that was my job. Wow. Uh, so this is the this is the Minuteman 3 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System across Montana, North Dakota, Colorado, and Nebraska. There's 450 nuclear silos underground. A launch control capsule. I was a launch officer. I'm directly responsible for 10 launch facilities. I can be responsible for more. I've been in charge of 20 or 30 at a time, so I'm in charge of the maintenance, security, and operations. But there's always two people down there, a commander and a deputy. And if we get a, an emergency action message from the president saying it's go time, then uh, that was my job. Uh, we would verify the message. We would take a key out of a safe. We would put it into the console. And you need two sets of hands per person, four people. There, there's two switches oh. each there's no it's impossible for one person to turn all four at the same time and that's that's how you launch is there is there like so being the guy that you can't disobey the order when you're told you got to do it but you know the responsibility of engaging and doing that is there extra training to make sure that you're properly mentally tough to handle that moment i i, I did take a like a personality test uh, when I commissioned. Um, so they had that information before they assigned me the career field. I didn't know what it was. Uh, you know, they, they asked for my dream sheet. You know, when you go to Maxwell officer training school, uh, they tell you, what do you want to do? You can ask. Uh, I said, cyber space and Intel. And they're like, no, we're going to give you missiles. We're going to give you, uh, nukes. Wow. And I didn't know what it was. Uh, and you go to Vandenberg, it's now Vandenberg Space, uh, space Base uh, in California. And I, I spent almost two years there. But then I went to North Dakota. And in a four year period, I spent over 300 days, 324 hour shifts underground in a launch control capsule. Wow. I, I, I have a question, bro. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> asking for a friend. So, for example, if there's a bunch of guys uh, sitting in the bunker and uh, they literally agreed that uh, they uh, hate balalaikas and matryoshkas, can they just launch an ICBM? Uh, <laughs> like we don't we don't have all the information to launch. Uh, we, we have to enter something in the console that can only come from the president. The president so, has a football. Yeah, that's what the <laughs> nuclear football is. Yep. Uh, the, you know, it's this football phone, and uh, they're called strike officers. They can either come from the Air Force or the Navy. I was eligible to be that job. If I had stayed in the Air Force until I was a major and I, I applied for it, then I could have been an attache assigned to the president. And, you know, there's, there's a group of people, so they have different shifts, but mm -hmm. they're always with the president with the strike options. And, uh, you know, from there it goes to the Joint Chiefs at the Pentagon, and then the message goes out. If Russia were to all out launch against the United States, we've got less than 30 minutes to react and our stuff would have to get off the ground before it's all destroyed. That's right. Very similar procedure for, I mean, he's talking strategic level weapons, very similar procedure for the tactical weapons. We had them on some of the ships I was on and it was the same kind of thing. Two person integrity throughout the entire time. You had to wait for authentication. And yeah, it was physically impossible for somebody to just wake up on Thursday morning and say, oh, I've decided I don't like Russia or China or whatever and start shooting. It doesn't, it's not physically possible. All right. How, how does um, a day of uh, an officer look like? 
like uh, down there in the bunker because you have to stay there for like a shift without internet of course and things like that what do you do there uh, so we do have uh computers down there oh. uh, they run cables 60 feet underground so the, the actual computer is topside but then we have a 60 foot cable to go down to plug into a monitor we have a mouse we have a keyboard uh, sometimes it wouldn't work, like the internet wouldn't work or the computer wouldn't work. Uh, but I'd say like 70% of the time it would work. And we have a DVD player and we've got exercise equipment down there. But no, it's a 24-hour shift. Uh, there, there is a, a bed. So the rule is only one of us has to be awake at all times. Uh, there's certain procedures where both of us have to be awake and at the console. But between a 24-hour shift, I, I mean, I could get a solid 10 hours between a nap and a, a full-time sleep if I wanted, and so could my deputy. Uh, so there's only like four hours really where we're both still awake. Right. Wow, crazy tales, man. Crazy tales. That's really cool. Um, so now we turn to Yulia. Um, maybe a tale from living in America. You know, from like early days, days when you first got there and stuff, you know? See, it's, it, that's interesting because I feel like I have more tales and more like cultural shock from living in, in Ukraine or sort of like coming back to Ukraine after 13 years. Because oh, okay. you need to you need to realize that I've been living in the United States since I was like 16 or, or something like that. So that's, uh, I moved there during my formative years. So while I don't consider myself Ukrainian American, because that's not, not my nationality, I'm Ukrainian, I'm incredibly Americanized. And I haven't been to Ukraine for nine years before I came back. And that's not for the lack of desire to come back, but sort of a rough immigration situation and, you know, a lot of things going on. So I think I'm more... Um, I'm more shocked at like coming back to Ukraine and comparing the Ukraine I remember from like 13 years ago when I lived here to Ukraine today, mm -hmm. because I think that when I was leaving Ukraine for the United States, it was sort of like, you know, Ukraine was kind of like stuck a, a little bit in like a Soviet -er era. There weren't a lot of like modern things. There weren't a lot of, you know, cool cafes and restaurants and like a lot of development like that because, you know, there just wasn't. It was a different world. And now coming to Ukraine from the United States, I'm like, wow, we in the US are the third world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of like our life revolves around Amazon and cool gadgets that we can buy there. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> I feel like, I don't know, I don't even know how to voice this, but coming back to Ukraine, I sort of have this new appreciation. Coming back to Ukraine after living abroad for 13 years, especially in the US, which is like the land of opportunity that everyone loves, right? I want to say, of course, salaries are much better in the US, but life is more expensive as well. And you can obviously get like, you know, anything you want mm. at the click of your, I don't know, at the click of your keyboard within the next day, which is not the same thing in Ukraine, but I think that life is more, there is more life here because people actually are more present in, um, are more present. People mm -hmm. buy less useless shit, pardon my French, and people expend, it, it, people invest more in like experiences and going places and doing things with your friends and sort of like communication. And I also really like how digital Ukraine is. And I know everybody always says that when they first visit, but genuinely, I feel like the United States Postal Services is a place that I avoid like the plague because it <laughs> reminds me of like... <laughs> Lviv Central Postal Station, like back in like you know early two thousands, where there's this like old lady who hates her job and yells at you because her salary hasn't been paid for three months. While in Ukraine, you kind of can ship a package within like two seconds and you just drop it off and everything is pre kind of like pre filled for you. And it's, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I feel Sounds like awesome. I'm an I'm experiencing a, a, an Americanized person's cultural shock as to how cool Ukraine is, not vice versa. I don't remember any cultural shocks in the U.S. anymore. Uh, I, I, will I, tell have, you, uh, I say this. Oh, one last thing. I say this to everybody because I'm still shook. But like, you know, I'm used to like terrible American groceries because, the, you know, in comparison to Europe, they are horrible. And I discovered three months ago that cucumbers freaking have flavor. <laughs> 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 That's a cultural shock for me. 
so <laughs> regarding Amazon, I will rant a lot about Amazon. <laughs> I ordered this table because I need something to put my like a laptop or iPad uh, on, and I'm I'm like literally I'm using a box on a box on a gym mat you know like seriously it's like the, the most hipster table you can imagine and uh, it wasn't delivered yesterday because they freaking fucked up something um yeah but uh regarding digitalization this is something that i agree on again because um i'm here in uh north rhine westphalia uh in germany right now my internet speed is 20 mega megs per second, uh, which is uh, 50 times slower than in Ukraine. Yeah, you had really badass connections, right? You know, actually, this is something when I first started streaming, one of the things in my apartment in New York that was like a living legend on my channel is that I have Spectrum Internet in the US. And if you know what Spectrum is, you know how garbage it is. And I would be talking to my dad who is in Ukraine during an air raid and his picture would be crystal clear and I would be glitching. And <laughs> everyone who was watching the stream was like, you're in New York. This man is in Ukraine. What is going on? <laughs> but as to your table setup, I actually know a fantastic Ukrainian-owned company that operates in Europe that um, that makes a, a computer stands for your table. So I can like I don't remember it like their name because they recently rebranded. But I'm happy to send them your way, and I'm sure you can even probably figure out a sponsorship with them. Please, please do, please do. <laughs> I will sell a kidney, maybe even two. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell them sell their products and they'll give you they're actually very great they love to like send people things to that's test funny. that's funny uh jake we had a question from jilk in the chat um any stories of system failures or near accidents during your time in the silos yes uh, <laughs> that's so scary dude <laughs> well no these launch control capsules are on 24 hours a day they never are turned off so we prepare and we train and we practice all the time for fires and we get fires all the time. When you leave fluorescent lights on 24 hours a day, 365, you're just waiting for something to like melt and start smoking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have Comrex and the console. Everything is on 24 hours a day, 365. Uh, so yeah, yeah. There's a lot of misconfusion, uh, you know, w w when you start smelling something, you're like, is something burning? And you have to like go through these procedures to like turn things off to try and isolate it. If we lose one of our comracks, it's not a big deal. Even if we have to shut down the console, it's not a big deal. Uh, I can, I can explain you loosely how it works in the missile fields, but in each squadron, there's five launch control capsules, 10 per capsule. So that's 50 silos for one squadron, and I can see and monitor and take control of any of those 50. So there's five capsules. If one has a fire and it goes down, it's not a big deal. There's still four left. Even if two go down, not ideal, but you still have three left to monitor all 50. Mm. So yeah, there are numerous times where a capsule would go down for whatever reason. Maybe it was scheduled maintenance, and then another capsule would go down because something caught on fire. This isn't like you know, a major fire where someone's going to get like th third degree burns or something, you know, it's right. just like something is smoking. You can even maybe see it. It's just a wire somewhere that is overheated. Uh, so you, you have to deal with it, but yeah, yeah, we had, we had incidents like that every week, you know, wow. in the missile fields, oh, the army and the Navy and the Marines never have problems with that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, um, if you watch any retro computer content, they call it evil smoke when like a capacitor lets go or something and you're yeah. going to have to doctor the board, you know, for sure. Um, um, I've got a whole whack of super chats I can run through here, but we're going to put them off just a little bit more and because uh, I want to keep everything going. But I do want to give a shout out to the big NAFO 69 truck campaign that we've got going on with the... Uh, Portuguese battalion of the NAFO 69 Sniffing Brigade. Um, 
It is the pinned link in the chat, so you can get right to it to uh, help donate. There's been quite a few people donate uh, during the stream, and the uh, the cats over at the Portuguese Battalion wanted to give shout-outs to uh, the legendary Jonas Rowinski uh, from TVP World. Um and uh, the daily, the daily fella news and missile kitty. Um, they were big donators to the fund. Um, the daily fella is awesome. Yeah, yeah. So good shout outs there for sure. And um, we've got a list of people to shout out as well. But I can't get the list of the individual donators out of the thing. So they're gonna send it over, and we're gonna put up a community post and start thanking everybody that way. So I can, you know get in uh keep on it but speaking of donation stuff we gotta go to greg terry to get an update because um i mean maybe everybody still hasn't th ha heard the word yet but good works have been done well thank you dick and um yeah pretty amazing so uh, i was there and it's really shocking to be quite honest but uh, uh a couple of months ago when I was there on the front and Pete and I were talking and Pete just goes, man, we need an armored medevac. I, I'm having to leave guys laying and bleeding to death. I cannot get them. And um, so we, we, we figured out we had a need there and really interesting at the same time, had a couple of donors, one from San Diego, California, one from the state of Minnesota, contact our office here in Pennsylvania and say, you know, I think we need to try to find an armored vehicle for medevac. And it's just, that's how it started. Um, so this initial conversation with Professor Gertis and myself and these two donors and our office here in Pennsylvania uh, actually took place on March the 4th, which is <laughs> just last month. And actually on March the 11th, we initiated this project and the goal was to raise $200,000 and purchase three armored medevac vehicles out of the UK. Um, and that 200,000 would ensure them getting into your country would use export company once in the country um, at our base there. We will then modify them with drone jammers, double sided winches, the best run flat tire systems, uh, complete night vision, the whole nine yards. I mean, we're Cadillac guys. And yeah. um, not only are they fully armored, but they're also Kevlar reinforced in the cab, everything, bulletproof glass, the whole nine yards. And um, I got down just a few weeks ago. I was in just above Robotny and I was helping some medics there. And these two medics had a white ambulance, unarmored a blue light on top. And they said the same story, Greg, we, we, we cannot even get our, our comrades off the, off the battlefield right now. We're getting blown up. Um, and we're just, it's a problem. And I made the decision there without talking to our team. I said, okay, we're going for four armored vehicles now. So we increased the project to 260,000. Well, long story short, um, we raised uh, in 39 days, 262,000 sent um project initiated uh just out of an ideal march the 11th uh march april 18th 262,581 dollars 24 cent we raised six thousand seven hundred and thirty three dollars and 85 cent per day 280 dollars 58 cent per hour uh, now over top of that we also brought in some donations five thousand for the extended motorola batteries with the usb-c connection so the guys uh, about saving lives can be in the trenches carry an external power bank and keep their walkie talkies charged plus the antenna systems we also raised sixty five hundred dollars for a complete body armor set uh for project constantine for medics um full body armor head to toe basically uh, they'll look like superheroes. Uh, so total, and this is not even including the last two days, uh, we raised $271,081.24 over the last 39 days. Next steps are uh, we're in the export process now. Uh, they will then be imported into Ukraine through a third-party company we're using to avoid issues at the border. At that moment, I will meet them in Ukraine we will do the mods, put the big thank yous in the camouflage on the side to all the world community helping us with this. And then I'll personally deliver them uh, to the front lines in a convoy. Um, and if you really want something to shout about, guys, before I knew anybody, it's just myself and Zhenya, my partner there, the president of our nonprofit there in Ukraine. 
we, we were streaming and uh, I've worked in Ukraine for 26 years. I've worked in Russia for 30. And I, I, from day one, we were talking, I was just streaming, just a little stream, 20 or 30 people in it. And Jane and I were talking and the first missile struck and I made a commitment to him. I said, buddy, we'll help you. Um, no matter what, it's like my, my own family being attacked now. And this is personal to me. And, and I can, t I can witness to you guys that Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian, uh, camaraderie is like this. If, uh, we were attacked. If, if the shoe was on the other foot and, and my country here in the U.S. was at war, I know my Ukrainian brothers and sisters would be here helping me as well. That's just, that's the character of the Ukrainian. Uh, it, the DNA is incredible. Tough so, as steel. Uh, listen, legendary, man. So uh, we were streaming day one. We really thought maybe a little seven to ten day incursion. Putin take the tanks homes and uh, shock a, a, a mot and that would be it. Um, but that's not what unfolded. We're now in day, what, 786 of this war, and we will not stop. We will not stop supporting. But to this point, and this is before we became friends with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I've run uh, actually almost 11 months on the, on the front lines, and that's zero line, guys. I don't, I don't go to Kiev. I go straight to the zero um, and work with all these soldiers that I'm friends with, lots of commanders that I've known for 25 years. Uh, very, really good people, governmental deputies. Um, just a huge network we have there. And this is why we've been able to do that. Um, but to this point, and that's before I met, you know, Professor Gertis and, and um, Johnny over there and then Starsky and Rick and Dick and Andrew Mercado and I've been doing stuff together. And now, I, I you know, I'm meeting Jake for the first time and it, it's an honor. I um, appreciate that, Jake. And thank you for your service. Uh, I really mean that my grandfather's World War II hero, so I, just, I, I love our, our military, and so thank you for that, and Commander McMillan as well. Um, but I, I will tell you, uh, since day one of this war, we've raised $727,000 and uh, delivered that aid to the front lines. And if we keep up with the rate we're doing now, my office here informed me that we will raise $2.4 million this year, and I say, why not? Let's go for it. Um, it's amazing to me when the world comes together, what the world can do. It took our government six months to work through the chaos and madness to get us to the point we are today where we've moved something through the House of Representatives. But the good people of the world and grassroots efforts can come together and do amazing, massive things. And I um, want to thank you for that. Now, let me tell you the next leg up. I was going to I've already started letting the cat out of the bag, but I was contacted a couple of days ago uh, by Albuquerque City Council, Albuquerque, New Mexico. They had reached out to me a couple of months ago when I was in Ukraine and they said, uh, we see you there and we've been looking for somebody legit there uh, that actually is there and really doing a good job to help and connected with nonprofits and all that. Um, we we want to do something special. I said, OK, uh, be happy to. Well, I, re I received an email from them after we announced our armored vehicle project that we will be delivering. We, we met our goal. That's goal. Of raising the money mission accomplished mm -hmm. is when i put the keys in the medic's hands that'll be yeah. mission accomplished but goal accomplished uh so the city of albuquerque reached out to me the last couple of days and says we are donating a brand new armored ambulance for the city of Kharkiv. we're personally want it delivered to the mayor of Kharkiv. he is um uh in connection with our city mayor here and albuquerque and Kharkiv are sister cities so greg our city council has asked the three of us to get in touch with you. We see you there. I've been watching your stuff since really day one, just silently. And uh, would you please partner with Albuquerque and deliver our ambulance for us to Kharkiv? I said, are you kidding? Uh, absolutely. So they're doing their own export. I've just got to pick the vehicle up in Lviv. So we will actually be delivering four armored vehicles, all of, all of our communities working together, and an armored ambulance from the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So lots of good things happening. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Amazing stuff, man. Amazing Thanks, stuff. Buddy. Yeah. Thanks, Holy. Um, yeah. I wanted to get, I wanted to go back over to um, Jake here. Um, you recently had a chat with uh, uh, General Hodges, correct? And there was some talk, if I remember, about Iran and a few of the other sort of bees circling the Russian hive. Um was there any consensus on real unity from them and maybe being even worse in the future? You're talking about just generally military cooperation between yeah. these authoritarian regimes? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, they're trying to end the post-World War II international rules-based order. The number one rule is 
You can't steal your neighbor's territory. You can't just forcefully go into someone else's country and redraw the maps. Freedom of navigation of the seas is the other one. So for the last 70 years, the United States has put military bases all over the world to stop people from killing each other, to stop people from invading other countries. And it's crazy because as the culture in America has shifted and the United States wants to scale back, having troops overseas in other in other countries, more countries want military bases in their country now. Uh, you know, Vietnam is mm. talking about hosting U.S. military purses on their territory because they want protection from China. And for authoritarian governments around the world, uh, they do want to return to an age of empires. If you're the Russians and you have 6,000 nukes, if you're the Chinese and you have 1.3 billion people, and, and you're not democratic, you don't have real freedom for your people, I genuinely believe that when you're Xi or Putin and you get to this level and you've basically maxed out what you can do in an authoritarian regime where you restrict personal liberties, you don't respect uh, copyright laws, you don't respect patents, you don't respect personal property. How do you expand? How do you get more wealthy? And it's just by attacking your neighbors, killing them and taking their stuff. And I think Iran wants to do this. China wants to do this. Russia wants to do this. And the United States is the paranoid one in the democratic world who's been hoarding weapons for the last 70 years, convinced that this isn't over. And we don't live in this I forget the name of the author, but the famous book uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, we're living in a post-history world. Like there won't be any more major conflicts or world wars now that communism has been defeated, but that was 30 years ago and we were wrong. We're, we're back to an age of history. History is being made today. Uh, uh, get your gun, Johnny. It's time to go to war. Uh, yeah. These authoritarians are never going to stop. No, I think one of the major mistakes that the United States uh, kind of made in dealing with Russia, right, is that is thinking that the Soviet Union collapsed, sort of, because the Soviet Union is the Russian Empire, and and now the Russian Federation is the Soviet Union, and in my view, the Russian Empire and the way that they handled business and the way that they handled things and the way that they handled their neighbors and um, the people in in country just never changed. I also, I've recommended this multiple times on my channel, but I'm actually curious if maybe uh, Starsky or uh, Jake has uh, watched this interview. Um, it's of Yuri Bizmianov. He's a KGB agent, uh, well, was a KGB agent who defected in the um, like early 1970s. And he gave that interview in Canada in the 1980s. And he basically laid uh, laid out like how the KGB is trained to destroy the United States and how they're trained to brainwash people, like what their operations are like. And it's not just what he did in his department. He basically tells you everything that Putin was trained to do as well, because Putin was in the KGB at that same time, right? And uh, he basically says that the aim of Russia is to destroy the United States, and it is going to happen. And he kind of talks about information warfare, about how Russia deceives the United States and stuff like that. And people now are calling him uh, this person who had like forecasted this. Meanwhile, he hasn't forecasted anything. He had literally laid out the literal handbook that he was given on how to do this and how to destroy international affairs and especially influence the United States. It's a very, very good interview. It's like an hour and something long. The guy's name is Yuri Bizmanov. I'm, I'm sure Starsky will know how to spell that, but let me know if, uh, if anyone English speaking <laughs> needs to... Um, it's the spelling of that. And it's a really, really good interview. And I think that th what he says hasn't been taken seriously, obviously, but he had given a play by play of exactly what's going to happen in terms of how Russia, the, U the USSR is planning on influencing um, sort of like the global affairs and how this propaganda is being crafted and how they're playing with the US in that mm. way. That's yeah, part of the problem on that. that. Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah, I, I confirm that uh, Yuri Bismianov, uh, guys, if you can watch his interview on YouTube, mm -hmm. it's it's there. Uh, there are basically four stages of uh, uh, 
ideological informational, subversion. Yeah, informational operation. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, we all agree that we're going through the, through the last stage. Uh, and uh, if you can find him, Yuri Bezmenov, guys, uh, everybody who watch us right now, please do that uh, after the show. Yeah, the fourth step is called is normalization, where basically he he says there will come a point in time where someone could be standing in a concentration camp, and they would look at you and say, "No, I'm not in a concentration camp." And we've seen some of those behavioral patterns now. So that was 1984. I did a full breakdown on that uh, about six months into the war. And uh, Starsky's right, Yulia's right. Uh, he, <laughs> He, he, it wasn't prophetic. It was factual. It's turning out to be prophetic. That That is how they operated. But it goes all the way back to the days of Khrushchev. And it goes back to the days in the late 50s when Khrushchev came and he was giving the speech at the United Nations. And, and when he came out, the cameras on the street outside caught the protesters in the street talking about the same issues that, that free Ukraine was facing against Russia at that time. It's the same story today, guys. And it's just been in process um, but now we're reading the we're reaching the culmination of that fourth step. So spot yeah, on. I think I think part of the problem is that too many people in the West, I would argue a majority of people in the West, are convinced that they're smart enough to understand when they're being lied to and manipulated by this <laughs> stuff. And this is especially true of Americans, I believe. And yes. And I think that's part of the problem is even when you tell them and you show them the documentation of what's going on, they still, you know, no, 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 oh, that, that, that would never happen. I'm too smart to be tricked that way. Yeah. Hey, hey Dick, I got some breaking news. Uh, yes. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer just tweeted and he said the first procedural vote will happen on Tuesday. Okay. So the Senate was supposed to be in recess this week. The Senate is back in session. Uh, and, and, you know, when bills are introduced, there's like a 72 hour waiting period or whatever, but Tuesday, uh, the first procedural vote, this is probably to get closure. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, this will happen on Tuesday. So maybe the final vote will be Tuesday, maybe the next day, but the Senate isn't going home until this is done. So that, that basically wraps it into it now can be done as fast as it can be done. Yeah. Pushing it. Finally. And good news. So yeah. Good news. Tuesday night, potentially Biden could sign this. Correct. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, he did say that he's encouraging the Senate to take a very quick vote and get it done as soon as possible. And I think that if if they do get it done on Tuesday, he's going to sign it next uh, th that same day or next day. That's amazing. Which we're yeah. as what we were talking about in the beginning of the stream is we're looking at Friday to Saturday for the first deliveries to start hitting the front yeah. line. Yeah, exactly. And, um, Jake, this uh, this ties in with one of your. Uh, recent videos where you were like, the question is, uh, you said like something like, will uh, Mike Johnson adjust the calendar for um Oh, he was doing it on purpose. Yeah. He was given, he was given the house two weeks paid vacation every month to waste time. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was really. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. What she was like, can I be a house of, can I be a, um, a person in that house? They have vacation all the time. Can I join? I, well, How do I sign and they up? Take, and they take four-day weekends every weekend. They never work on Fridays or Mondays. So if you want to make $200,000 a year, wow. you only have to work like six days a month. That, that sounds good. To... Yeah. Uh, uh, there was uh, one uh, interesting remark uh, in the chat. And by the way, hello, everybody uh, who said hello, because I'm, I'm sorry, it's like, it takes a lot of time uh, to type. Hi. Uh, so uh, there was uh, a remark about Iran because uh, Iran uh, uses the same informational tactics uh, as Russia, basically copy pasting uh, Russian regime completely. And I absolutely agree on that. Um, again, I, I have uh, a lot of uh, friends in Iran, a lot of sources that uh, tell me, you know, things that I've seen and heard in Ukraine in uh, 2013, back during the times of a revolution, uh, when, uh, as we know, 
Ukraine was ruled by the pro-Russian dictator Yanukovych, who used absolutely sane tricks, uh, all the provocations that were made uh, to blame uh, people on the streets. Uh, somebody would uh, attack, uh, for example, policemen and, and beat them up, and uh, those people were, were later recognized as uh, servicemen of police. Uh, and, uh, like I, for example, I remember this day when, um, remember there was this, uh, grade or this tractor trying to push through the lines uh, of the conscripts, uh, protecting the administration of the president. And those guys, of course, they had no shields. They had no protection. Basically there were 18 year old conscripts just holding the line, but there were 100 journalists recording, uh, you know, like this uh, insane, you know, crowd trying to kill them. And uh, I was there. I was there. I walked to the guys to, to see the situation. Um, and uh, this big dude wearing a uh, blue and yellow bandana, uh, he told me in Russian, uh, he told me, Давай, давай, мы их сейчас порвем всех, мы их сейчас убьем, давай, вперед. Basically, he was like, uh, we will kill them all, just go. And he started, like, pushing me at those guys, uh, at, at the policemen. And uh, later, uh, the guys recognized that this man and other big dudes wearing those bandanas, they were uh, servicemen of Birkut, of uh, this uh, special, um, like, like SWAT in Ukraine. Uh, like, uh, completely corrupted structure, uh, big goons used by uh, Yanukovych as punishing force. So basically, they were doing provocation. Same stuff in Iran. Absolutely, uh, there were uh, guys at, like literally attacking uh, priests, uh, Muslim priests, and beating them up and screaming, you know, like stuff. Um, and later, of course, they were recognized as like service men. So they're using absolutely same methods. There's, guys, there's thousands of cases that uh, we can talk about, but. Uh, what what makes situation very very bad is because Russia developed hybrid warfare and now other terrorist countries are implementing this hybrid warfare which sucks which uh, is something very bad because we are not prepared and the steps that we are doing right now in different countries around the world in 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 the free world uh, those steps are not enough we have to have uh, a strategy and uh, some some very very strong solution against this yeah something that um that ties in with um what you know chad has been talking about it and i think sarsky you also mentioned it and everything and yulia mentioned it and um is basically russia you know the Soviet, um, Soviet Russia hasn't collapsed, you know, they're still doing that same thing. Um, and what they've always been doing. Um, and I mean, you guys know, last week I spoke about this book, the Russian colonialism 101, by the way, the, I'm going to plug our new show. Tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Ukraine time, Maxim is going to be on our show. It's going to be awesome. He's going to talk about his book. Um, but he actually says that um, he specifically talks about, okay, this place gets independence from Russia. Um, and then, let me get it now. Sorry, guys. Um, I had it. Um, <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um, so the nation declares independence. Okay. Russia comes um, and the occupation collapses amid the 1917 revolutions. And then in 1921, no, and then Russia comes back. Russian colonialism now with a communism label comes back. Um, 
And that keeps happening everywhere. It's just uh, the Russian regime has changed, but Russia hasn't changed. Um, and it's the same thing here now, where it's not it's no longer Soviet Russia, but their practice is the same. Um, and what they're doing is the same, and their propaganda is the same. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a replay under a different branding. It's like Microsoft mm -hmm. always changing the name of one of their products. It's still the same damn thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there are. Um, oh, Yana, you wanted a. There's a picture we have loaded up here. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Um. So, this guy was killed in. Well, his wife and son was killed um, on the evening of, like March the first, mar one March, two March, around that time. And um, in this past week, he actually also went to, he went to America to speak to Mike Johnson. Mm. Um, and there's been this question um, about whether or not um, that maybe influenced um, I, I can Mike answer Johnson. That. But I really, I agree with I you on your answer ahead, with Jay, APAC. I, know both I really guys agree personally. with uh, The I answer is absolutely no. There's only yeah, one person who had a say in anything that happened this week, and it was Donald Trump. Yeah. Mike Johnson went down to Florida last week, and he got permission, got permission to do all of this. It was sped up by the Iranian attack against Israel because Israel wants their aid bill passed. But Donald Trump gave up opposing this because he's the one behind the scenes. All of these, like the vote today, people voting for it, people voting against it, they were able to do whatever they wanted without fear of being attacked by Donald Trump. When you're in the Republican Party and you do something that Trump doesn't like, he's going to tweet at you, he's going to say you're a rhino, that you're not really MAGA, you're not a true believer. But Trump doesn't want to talk about Russia and Ukraine for the next six months. It's a losing issue for him. The majority of Americans support Ukraine. He wants to talk about domestic issues, wokeism, inflation, uh, the border. Mm -hmm. uh, so Trump made a political calculation what was best for him, and he didn't want to do this anymore. So I'm sure Mike Johnson, and I'll give Mike Johnson credit. I think Mike Johnson had to convince Trump to go along with this. But the fact that Trump is not attacking Johnson, Trump's not helping him either, but he's not attacking Johnson, which means Johnson got his approval that's why Johnson has flipped, and now he's saying all the correct things. It's pr it's pretty shocking to watch a human being 180 so fast uh, with their yeah. rhetoric. But, I mean, I can pull up the clip of Johnson saying, we can't let Ukraine be another Afghanistan. I know the yeah. word I know the word credibility, and it has nothing to do with this scenario. <laughs> hey, Dick, can you put that picture back up there? Yes, can. Or Yana? So uh, just to compliment what Jake is saying, he's spot on, and that's this. So I know both of those guys standing with Johnson there personally, uh, especially the guy on the right. Anybody know who that is? His name is Pavlo Ungurian. He's a former deputy of Odessa. We are very, very close friends. He's one of my best friends in Ukraine. He is the guy that actually makes all of my connections for me in, uh, in the Rada and in Kiev. He is very cool. powerful man inside Ukraine, and he is anti-Mike Johnson. He is pro Ukraine. Um, he is from the evangelical right, but he is a wonderful, wonderful human being supporter of Ukraine. And I promise you, uh, they had no influence on Mike Johnson's decision. It was Donald Trump. Um, but it, it's it's really a good picture showing solidarity. I I think we just had the perfect storm come together and and, and Trump greenlight it. And then Jake's analysis is correct. If he greenlights it, then those who are afraid of him. Um, they relinquish. There's a there's cool. an event that I don't think people remember. I want to quick mention, but mm -hmm. David Cameron, when he was at the NATO summit, put out this really slick video where he's walking through a hallway, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he says at the end of the video, "I'm I'm going to go to Washington D.C. to meet with Mike Johnson," and Mike Johnson refused the meeting. The Speaker of the House refused to meet with 
the United Kingdom's uh, Foreign Affairs Secretary. I think that's his title. But David Cameron did go to Mar-a-Lago to talk to Trump directly. And there's no pictures or videos of this event. So I thought it went terrible. I thought, well, Trump didn't even allow a photo op. So this must have gone horribly with David Cameron. But this was literally right before Mike Johnson showed up. So in the back of my mind, I think David Cameron, off the record, talking to Trump directly in Florida, said said something that might have helped change Trump's mind. Johnson shows up two days later. Johnson then gets permission. So hopefully, I, I want to I want to hope that all these foreign leaders talking to and 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 communicating this. Trump was president when David Cameron was. I know. Was he still was he still prime minister when Trump was president in 2017? When did David Cameron uh, resign? I think there was overlap there, isn't there? Yeah, there yeah. was. There, there's overlap. Yeah, yeah, there had to have been overlap. There so these was. guys knew each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, there is uh, Professor Gerdas there in the chat. Hello, Professor. It's very nice to see you. Um, one thing I want to say uh, as a communication specialist, okay. Uh, the way uh, some some specific people in the Republican Party, the way they spread misinformation uh, against Ukraine is actually like it doesn't help their potential uh, voters at all because like I don't understand what why they don't understand this because if you have such uh, you know, uh, conflict within the uh, community of people who will be electing you and voting for you uh, you know some people uh, you know uh, support Ukraine some people don't support Ukraine uh, and uh, you in your party you have speakers that uh, spread disinformation against Ukraine and basically uh, fueling the conflict within the community of your voters, it it like it's bad. It's it's bad for your political pa- party. It's, it's bad for your political movement and basically your your future, right? Because you you live in a democratic country. Uh, so again, this is something they should think about because uh, having uh, such people as uh, uh, Marjorie Trader Green and, uh, and 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 uh, similar people. Like it's it's bad for you and your uh, your political opportunities. I don't understand why they don't see that. Maybe they do, but start. W- start w- w- I can answer that question for you. Yeah. Uh, yes, so in the age of the internet, politics has changed. If you wanted to get elected to Congress, if you wanted to be a senator or a congressman back in the '90s, you mm-hmm. needed party help. You needed the guys in the back room smoking cigars to call their contacts and, and, and get you the fundraising dollars. But in the age of the internet, you just need a million people to give you 20 bucks and you can get elected to Congress. So, so Marjorie on Twitter has 3.5 million followers. Even if 90% of those people hate her and they're only following her to make fun of her, when she grows, when she gets bigger, she still attracts more people that will then give her five, ten, twenty dollars. She's never going away. She's going to stay in Congress forever. And there are these um, these uh, contrarians that do this. Uh, they're all over Twitter now. They're all over social media. Jackson Hinkle is the biggest con artist in the world. The dude's twenty four with no life experience, but he knows as a shiny white guy if he talks <laughs> pro Iran. There's people in the Muslim world that will follow him on social media. They'll give him money. They'll sign up to be a subscriber. They'll give him three bucks a month or whatever. And the dude's the dude's a millionaire. He's a genius, in my opinion. If he if he has no ethical problems supporting dictatorships around the world, and Professor yeah. Gertis in there as well. He a couple other statements he made is um, like if you talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Her, her positivity rate in her district, I think he said last night it's plus 37. So she has no chance of being uh, taken out of her office. So she's free to roll and do whatever she wants. And no, Professor Gertis, I will not drop the camera whore statement again that you called. <laughs> um, but I, I will, <clears throat> Professor Gertis, oh, this is the shills. I can say it. Professor Gertis got very upset last week when we were streaming and called her a camera whore. 
Wow. Did you say a, a camera whore? I did. That was a pushing of the envelope for Professor Gerdes. <laughs> I believe his sweater vest got bunched up or something, and he got for, really excited. For um, Professor Gerdes to come out like that and call Marjorie Crater Green a camera whore, that's but a big deal. He, he made another comment in here, and I completely agree with this. Um, I do believe there is a connection. Well, there's two things. Uh, there is a connection between what's ha happening in Iran and being, being um, brought to the place where uh, it was approved in the House today. Of course, on top of that, Trump definitely greenlighting something. And remember, guys, Trump will only do what benefits Trump. He is a narcissistic person. So he can see he's in two court cases right now. Things aren't going the best for him. So he also has to think, and I'm sure his strategists are thinking, what's the best look for us right now? Um, so there's a lot of things coming together that, that, that brought us to this day. So regardless, it, it, it's a, it's a positive day. We just need to push forward with it now. And I also think it's worth mentioning that what we used to think of as the Republican party, the GOP really isn't anymore. It's now the cult of Trump. Agreed. Yeah. There is also, I think what I want to. What I wanted to add to, like, I forgot who started. I think it was Jake who started the uh, who started talking about the subject. Basically, like, Trump is it's a PR move for Trump as well because, first of all, yes, the majority of Americans support Ukraine, and a lot of Trump supporters support Ukraine. Like, you wouldn't believe the amount of. I'm very uh, uh, evidently anti-Trump, and I very evidently always speak my mind to the best of my ability with absolutely no filter and that pisses a lot of people off and you wouldn't believe the amount of soldiers that are fighting in ukraine that are american that dm me constantly obviously patronizing me because i look young and i'm a woman so uh they say things like oh what do you know about trump right now because you know ukrainians in ukraine seem to only know this this and that about trump right now and i'm like dude i've lived in, in the u.s for 13 years please don't teach me about trump i've, I've gone through all the cycles of this person <laughs> But <laughs> like, you don't need to tell me that I'm getting the wrong headlines in Ukraine. No, I hate the dude justifiably because I've gone through immigration hell because of him and a lot of other things. And also, he's just fascist. Uh, but <laughs> but um, yeah, but uh, and I say that responsibly. But anyways, but so point is that there are a lot of uh, that there are a lot of his voters that believe that he's good for Ukraine, and there are a lot of his voters that are single issue voters that are very much for Ukraine because their families are fighting in Ukraine, like their husbands or their sons, and they see that Trump isn't helping the cause. So I think that that's also quite a bit of a quite a bit of a PR move for him because now he can use it as saying that like, oh well. Mike Johnson helped Ukraine. Oh, well, Trump, you know, Mike Johnson is is like is, is talking to Trump about this because one of the things that really I, I couldn't understand how people who support Ukraine un unequivocally can vote for Trump. And the thing is, like Trump's propaganda in that way, right, like in the in these circles kind of runs very similarly to how Russian propaganda runs. Like, for instance, a lot of these soldiers who fight at, like in the foreign legion in Ukraine, believed that actually Trump was the person who gave Ukraine military aid. And, you know, obviously Obama didn't because his reaction was awful, right? And uh, Biden didn't. But the javelins and the HIMARS and everything, that was Trump. Trump was the first person who gave Ukraine military aid. So they think that they've actually been led to believe that this person is good for Ukraine. And the fact that he says all of these anti-Ukrainian things praises Putin, it's selective hearing. It's basically confirmation bias, right? Because they were going to vote for him anyway. So they will find the things that work for them to justify voting for him. And so I think for those people that can justify that, this was a great move. And now he doesn't have to deal with it. And unfortunately, I think that this is this is really this is really shitty and really sad because this is going to play in his favor favor somehow. I'll just I'll just say that the Republican Party died in 2018 when John McCain passed away. Uh, Mitt Romney is retiring from the Senate this year. He's not running for reelection. Yeah. And the two living former vice presidents, Mike Pence and Dick Cheney are not supporting Trump, even though he's the nominee this year. Uh, so whatever whatever the Republican Party existed as under Ronald Reagan, George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., obviously Romney and McCain were the nominees in 2008 and 2012. They're all gone. They have nothing to do. Trump has turned 
the Republican base against itself in yeah. this self-destructive downward spiral. I don't, I don't understand what they're getting from it. They think they're getting something from Trump, but uh, my prediction is they're, they're sticking it to the lips. <laughs> I, I could what, not How does that improve your life? It, it doesn't, does but that, that's, they're does, so angry and frustrated. They don't care if it destroys themselves. They just want to stick it to the people that they see or think. How, do, how does sticking succeeding. it to the libs yeah. bring down health care costs? Or, it doesn't. You know, they don't care. They're idiots. <laughs> you know, I can actually speak on this from professional experience based on like research, right? So I'm a train. So my degree is in psychology and, and in user experience design. So actually user research and how things affect people in how they interact with the world basically is something that I that I actually like, I'm a professional in. I became a reporter two years ago because I love geopolitics and history. But before that, I did this. So one of the things that I can speak on as to what like m the MAGA thing is, right? It's a cult. And a lot of the times, and I've said this on my streams before, so people who watch me will probably be like, oh, she's talking about this again. But since, <laughs> but since there are a lot of a lot more people here that haven't heard this, I will um, I will share this with you as well. So. MAGA is a cult, right? Like they're not, this is not, this is not benefiting them in any way. This is legitimately one of the brightest examples of a cult. So when we think of cults, but we don't call them cults, the Nazi Germany was a cult as well. And one of the things for these cults, especially these big ones, is branding. And through branding, we can see that it's uh, that it's that type of movement and that type of cult. For for instance, MAGA, like Make America Great Again, is the same swastika. And one of the things that I think people get wrong a lot of the times is... Um, is that uh, people compare like Putin to Hitler or, you know, uh, or things like that. And I think that's a very wrong comparison because Hitler was a product of Goebbels. Hitler was a brand that was created by someone else behind the scenes that went very viral in our, what would be called viral in our day. And it was just a face that then became like the, you know, the, the sort of like the key figure of the movement. So I think that in this case, Putin is Goebbels and Trump is Hitler because Trump is just uh, is, is sort of like he's a made up personality and he is the cult leader because he's the face of that cult. And, um, you know, it doesn't benefit anyone. MAGA doesn't benefit anyone. It doesn't benefit the politicians. It doesn't benefit. It doesn't benefit anyone who participates in it. But these are usually people who are lost, and people who end up sort of lost in the sauce of these cults and these ideas are the people who want to feel like a part of something greater. Trump enabled the hate for women. Trump enabled the hate for minorities. Trump enabled the hate for LGBTQIA. Trump enabled all of this. He didn't create it. It was already in there it was just repressed because the society was uh, was not okay with it and he came in and was like yes you know what immigrants are the problem you know women who get abortions are the problem you know the gays are the problem everything is the problem and it's really easy to unite and hate and if you're sort of lost and you feel like you're no longer contributing to the society in the meaningful way whatever that means for you you feel like oh my gosh you are now part of this mission this mission to eradicate these you know anti-christian people these uh horrible women who kill babies, you know, these immigrants that come here from, um, for some reason, the entirety of Latin America is Mexico these days for Trump. But anyways, who come here from Mexico it, 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 with guns and stuff. And that's, that's, that's that, you know, like for him, all of these issues is what, what, what Jews were painted as in World War II. And MAGA is the swastika. And that's kind of, uh, it, I mean, this is the most oversimplified thing, the most oversimplified <laughs> explanation of this. But if you look into how but it's um, frighteningly accurate. Yeah, into marketing and branding of this, then from a purely design standpoint, like this is funny because this is actually done, this analysis is done from a design standpoint, which I don't think anyone would actually think of it that way. And that's what it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, clarify something there in the chat because in the chat there's uh, a lot of furious comments. Uh, I will clarify something as a PR manager because this is where I have a degree at. Uh, having uh, like uh, branding is not bad. Uh, having a brand is like it, it's a normal thing because whatever you have a political movement and a, a commercial organization, a religious organization, whatever you you gotta have your brand, of course, to to uh, look different and to attract people who want to be part of your community. But at the same time, you have to see. Uh, 
um, who promotes Trump. Okay, uh, and we can see that on the Russian television, Trump is promoted as our guy uh, a lot. Guys, this is something you probably don't know, but uh, on the Russian television, Salavyov, Skabeyeva, they all talk about Trump as our guy. Our guy does good job. Uh, this is what they say. I have a big um, collection of videos. Uh, I, I will include them in one of my upcoming videos. But uh, this is what Russians say on the Russian uh, national television. If uh, Russian national television talks good about you, there is something wrong about you, guys. This is, yeah, you, you got to be very, very careful with that. Hey Dick, yeah. I'm gonna yes, I'm man. gonna sign off for the for the stream now. I was just gonna ask you because I was pretty sure your time limit had come. So yeah, uh, oh, yeah well, uh, let's give Jake you. the floor here for a goodbye. Uh, uh, on my channel, uh, I've been consistent the last two years. Russia will be defeated. The ground forces are incompetence. They're absolute evil. Uh, the democratic world is not gonna tolerate this. Um, it's a question of just time and eventually Russia will break. That's all. Good yeah. talking to everybody. Good words, Thank Jake. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Take care, buddy. Bye. That was a great chat with Jake. Loving that very much. So yeah, I'm looking at the time here and we've got about 15 minutes or so. And then at the end, I'm going to run through a whole bunch of donation shout outs and whatnot, because we haven't even really had time to get to them. Right. I just didn't want to wreck the flow or anything. Um, is there anything we covered that anybody wanted to backtrack and talk about, or was there a point we still hadn't gotten to yet? Yeah, well, absolutely. I, like ev everybody likes Jake Bro because Jake Bro is cool. Because Jake Bro served in the uh, United States Air Force, uh, which is probably like the, the coolest branch. Uh, I think everybody will agree with me. Okay. As an infantry, okay, uh, I may not really think like that, but it doesn't stop me from being envious like hell, uh, you know, towards. Uh, the Air Force. Chair Force. <laughs> <laughs> one, of my, one of the things that I appreciate about Jake is he does this thing where, um, and he mentioned it earlier in the stream, where he said that um, in two years, Russia has advanced 14 kilometers in the east. And he's also spoken about how Bahmut, how, how Russia turned Bahmut into this massive, you know, propaganda win. But mm. that was seven kilometers that they managed well, to get in one year, you know. Starsky. And that kind of thing put things into oh. perspective for us, yeah. Starsky, do you remember, um, oh, it was way back when we were, uh, first six months of maybe a year we were doing the show, you were talking about the snail being faster than the Russian army, right? That was yeah. brilliant, man. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, but uh, speaking of Jake, he's an amazing guy. Guys, if you are not subscribed to Jake, you can fix it right now or after the stream. You got to do it 100%. Uh, yes. Yeah, and again, I I think you know, like I think uh, your branch uh, will always be part of you. For example, if you take a look at Commander McMillan here, you can imagine him like uh, you know uh, being this uh, old wise sailor smoking a pipe, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, you know uh, like uh, putting those. Uh, wise remarks here and there uh jake bro is uh, he's like he's our shining superstar uh, i'm not afraid to say that because he's so cool uh, personally uh, today uh, it, it's it's not just today but uh my girl here she 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 goes like why are you grumpy all the and i'm like like <laughs> Like, like, what, are are you mad at me or something? I'm like, no, I, I, it, it's, this is my normal face. I, 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 I was uh, a sergeant in the infantry. This is my normal face. This is how I, you know. So I, I think it, it definitely uh, becomes like part of you forever. 
Yeah. No, no one has ever seen a good sergeant smile. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what that's why I I suck as a sergeant. That, that's why I became commissioned. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to practice that grumpy face to get back to that side of things. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. So um, we should steer ourselves to a little bit of wrap-up conversation, and then I'm going to raffle off all kinds of uh, shout-outs and stuff. So uh, let's turn here. I'm going to start at the bottom of uh, the hexagons and work my way up here. So we'll start with Yana. Um uh, shout out for Project Constantine and what's going on and big shout out for tomorrow, right? Yeah. Um, so thanks everyone for supporting Project Constantine. Um, it really helps. We're able to help the soldiers. We're able to, you know, help ourselves and everything. Um, and then remember about tomorrow, we have Maxime Erisavi on the new show. Yeah, it's got to be awesome, Yulia. It's got to be awesome. Um, so he's going to join us. Um, and it's going to be me and uh, Annette, who you guys know as CF Beauty. So she's also going to join us. And then my friend, Olya Bateman, who you can find on Twitter. So she's also going to join us. Um, and we're going to discuss his book. Um, it's going to be awesome. Um yeah, and the show is just basically we're going to focus on um, just, you know, uh, promoting and amplifying Ukrainian voices, um, doing all of that. So, yeah, hope to see you guys there. Awesome. Oh, awesome. and donate to the NAFO, the Shul's mm. NAFO fundraiser as well. Do that as well. NAFO fundraiser, get in there, be there, or be square, and all that cool stuff. Uh, well, I will go over to Commander here. What do you think, Commander? Uh, excuse me, I got the hiccups. Um, I <laughs> yeah, I did. I I'm glad that the legislation got through the House. Uh, I still want to re-echo my same chant that I do at the end of every show when you ask me that. Continue to press your elected officials. Right phone call, email, whatever, because this isn't the end of it. The more pressure we bring to bear, the more aid and the more important types of aid are likely to be freed up. Mm -hmm. please, please keep that going. Good shout. Good shout. Let's turn to Operator Starsky here. What do you think, buddy? Thank you, bro. Uh, so first of all, thank you, the Shills family, uh, Jana, Yulia, Commander, uh, Greg, and uh, my bro, Dick. Uh, and, uh, of course, it was really, really nice to see uh, Jake bro here. Um, and Secular Sakai, thank you guys for your awesome uh, questions and comments uh, and remarks. Uh, but most of all, thank you so much for your support. Uh, Ukrainians will never forget uh, you know, not not just uh, military aid, not uh, humanitarian aid, uh, your donations, but uh, your uh, empathy and your support, even just words of support for Ukrainians. We will always remember that and we will always keep you in our hearts. Thank you so much. Good shout. Good shout. Greg Terry, you've got a, an announcement as well. Yeah. As, um, yeah. Well, thank you once again, Dickie. Uh, Dawson, and yes, I'm the only one in the world allowed to call Dickie Dawson, Dickie Dawson, <laughs> and uh, Starsky's always going, yo, bro, yo, bro, <laughs> and I uh, got him down, uh, so thank you to everybody on the panel tonight, especially Commander McMillan, uh, once again waxing uh, a little bitter when uh, Starsky calls him out, but it's nice to watch him, and uh, Jake being on here as well as Julie and Yana and Dick for hosting, and all of the Shills family, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I do want to give a thank you as well for Professor Gertis. He's been in the chat. We, we, we've we become very good friends, and uh, we basically work together every day. Um, and he was a real spearhead of this project for the Armored Vehicles. And um, just a big shout-out to Prof and to all of his community. But I want to share something. Last night we gave away a battle flag um, signed on the Zero Line. Uh, this is full-size battle flag here. Um, so... 
It's got a drawing of Shevchenko from an artist on the zero line. And of course it's signed by fish. One of the, uh, one of the frontline heroes that is a part of our community. Everybody in my channel knows who fish is. He, he comes on sometimes and talking about the war. So I have multiple of these, but we're so thankful to all of you people all throughout the world who have um, helped us with this project. And over the next four or five weeks, you will see personally your gift, your love in action as we deliver those vehicles to the front uh, we do fundraisers, you know, but a lot of times it's just through proof in the pudding. We're dropping the aid and you guys are donating and, and we're so thankful to that. But we do want to be able to give back. Last night, Professor Gertis and I were on and we gave away one of these flags and spun a wheel of fortune. And I had two issues last night, my audio. And number one, the audio is fixed. As I promised you, it's booming and busting today. Oh, and everything's yeah. good. But um I didn't really like how the flag giveaway went last night with the spreadsheet. So I have uh, six days now to get a better system. Dick was helping me earlier today on an idea. Going to come up with a better way for you guys to sign up. And next Friday night on my channel, we're going to give away another signed battle flag, guys. No raffling, no donating, nothing. It's just thank you. And somebody in the world will will win it and uh, we'll ship it right to you. We've been shipping flags and it's just just whatever we can do because without you guys, without us standing together um, as a team, uh, different backgrounds, different countries, different nationalities, different religious affiliations, different political affiliations, different everything, but we stand mm -hmm. together united for Ukraine. And we will continue to do so do Peramoga, until victory. And um, I'm excited to be a part of this great family and we want to be able to give back to you guys. So thank you very much and uh, make sure you're there. You have to be on the stream because we spin the wheel and you got to say, I'm here. Um, so, and you will win the flag. So thank we'll you guys have, for that. We'll have a and if it goes, if it's messed up next week, it's Dick Dawson's fault. <laughs> exactly. It always comes down to that, doesn't it? <laughs> but we'll be shouting this out on our community page as well to make oh, sure yeah. everybody uh, gets in on it. So, uh, Yulia, um, um, precious guest and joiner of the show. <laughs> what do you think? Thoughts and wrap ups. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I will also sing some praise to Jake Bro because it seems like a moment, a, a ten minute appreciation of Jake Bro and his existence. So I have to, so I have to join in. But it was uh, actually very nice to speak to him. I've heard, I mean, I've I've seen him online. I've never actually spoken to him really. So I, I do, uh, you know, I do really appreciate his family, uh, his family, his commentary. <laughs> Someone said family in the chat. <laughs> I appreciate his family. <laughs> I appreciate his um, commentary, ADHD in action, and. Uh, uh, I do I do agree with him on a lot of things. It was also very nice to finally speak to Operator Starsky here because, you know, you're kind of a legendary figure in the uh, English-speaking Ukrainian news world. So I've heard a lot about you as well. So it's very nice to uh, to have been able to speak to you as well and meet everyone. And um, hi, Greg, again. <laughs> Hello, Yulia. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was very nice to meet you, Mr. McMillan, as well. It was a very good conversation, and I really appreciate that you guys invited me here. And uh, I swear I'm not a crazy conspiracy theorist who likes to uh, compare, you know, Putin <laughs> to Goebbels and Trump to Hitler, but it's just... Um, it is what it is. <laughs> oh, cool, and cool. also, mm -hmm. since since we're talking about fundraisers, so I don't know if you're going to see this, but this is a fantastic sweatshirt from a Ukrainian brand. Uh, it says Russia is a terrorist state, and it's not one of those like kind of uh, weird. See, as a designer, I have to say ugly Amazon sweatshirts. I'm sorry. <laughs> but this one is a Ukrainian <laughs> brand, and all of the profits from the sale of these sweatshirts goes to... Um, goes to the military. Now, I'm not trying to sell you a sweatshirt because they're sold out, but <laughs> but I did get the last large uh, in existence and they're, I, I guess, not going to make them anymore. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to have this. So we are fundraising for a drone and we're almost through with it. And that drone is for the chosen company. But today, uh, my friend from the HUR unit reached out and was like, ah, I've seen your fundraising for drones. Guess who needs drones? And so, so I figured that uh, the next drone fundraiser, everybody who donates, uh, is going to be automatically entered into the raffle for the last known sweatshirt that says Russia is a terrorist state in existence. If they <laughs> donate more than $20. 
Well, more than 10 or more than 20. I'm not sure yet. Okay. <laughs> We're going to iron it out. But um, I do have one, uh, you know, one right here. It's in this really cool packaging. Uh, it's made in Ukraine and it's a really nice sweatshirt. And technically we're donating twice because I've already donated to the military by purchasing the sweatshirt. <laughs> so <laughs> we're also going to get a drone out of it. So, yeah, I hope cool. that, that works. And, uh, thank you for giving me the time of day. <laughs> also, awesome. Yulia is going live after this. So oh, yeah. go check out her stream after this. All right. Yeah, let's get the link in the uh, let's get the channel links and everything I've here. I've uh, posted it, but I'll post it again. Okay, here. Um, there's her channel right there at Ilya, and uh, there's everything you need to know right away, fellow babies. Going on over because you got more cool content to watch. All right, so um, I am gonna rip through and really long lifts of super chats and stuff. So, yeah, so anybody that needs to bow out now that's on the stream can bow out. We've all said our goodbyes, and I'm gonna be a big mouth for like five minutes. You be the big mouth. <laughs> so, uh, we've got Kristen McCall came in as an apprentice. Hooten Coolio came in with a super chat. Ben Groves, a uh, member message shout out there. Uh, Taste de la Kulahana, gifting out memberships. J Penn, gifting out memberships. Edward Bennett, super chat. Nivon Way, super sticker. KP with a super chat. Tyler Doughty, Lynn S., Martin Lefebvre, all coming in with super chats. Tyler Doughty again. The Joker came in with something. Woo, we're blessed with talent today. We got Bobo Uzula coming in with a super chat. Danny Carver with a message. Cats Cats with a message. Georgie LaForge, Jordy's brother there, with a big super chat. Nikki Hill and Jilt came in with messages. Level 70 with a big super chat. Lord Flashheart was a new apprentice. John Pootler came in with a super chat. Crazy Cat 1 gifting out memberships. Garth McNeil came in. Ibag came in. Bev Groves came in. Ibag again. The Man of the Wood is chipping out a super chat. Danny Carver giving out memberships. I'm getting close here. Mitch Astown with a big super chat. Garth McHale came in with one. Evie D. Claire came in with gifting memberships. Uh, SSW Custom Sewings dropping super chats. We got Leslie Bow, Rhapsody Adams, uh, Pest Pogrom. I almost said popcorn there. Uh, those were big super chats. Paul Gilbert in with one. Um... Uh, dunk on you 23 with a cool super chat and a, a apprentice notification as well. Slick Willie D, a new member. Uh, Cam Camilla uh, Matt Matson is jumping in a good super chat. I'm almost there. Mr. E Man, new shill apprentice. Putin Julio, 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 Jake Bro, contest Midas Touch Network. Hey, that's a good shout. Frank Schifrin came in with a super chat. Dunk on you, 23's gifting out more memberships. WL's giving out 10 memberships. David N comes in with one at the end there. Great stream, the shells. Thank you. Plus, we had SSW Custom Sewing. Um, Nelly Cat came in with one. And uh, Wolfgang Peterson with direct donations as well. And I do believe I'm pretty much caught up. And I need to take a breath. So I think we're ready to wrap it up and call it one in the bag. What do you think, everybody? Huge shout out to everybody for the support, both on the NAFO truck campaign. Link is pinned to the top of the chat, everybody. Run on over and give us a hand getting this truck purchased. The quicker we get it purchased, the quicker we can supply more gear to even more people. Go, go, go. It's all in the name of supporting the free and sovereign nation of Ukraine to get those fucking orcs out the door. Let's do it. I think we're done, right? What do you think, everybody? Let's just good job see. hosting, Dick. Thank you, brother. <laughs> yeah, good show. Great I need a job, fucking Dick. nap now. <laughs> good night, everybody. Thanks for watching us. And if you're Hi, new everyone. around here, you know, click sub, care, maybe Percy. click like. Click share and uh, don't forget to come back because this is now the virtual pub in Ukraine that you got to visit once a week because you never know who's <laughs> going to be hanging out. See you soon, everybody. Thank you, brother. Slava Ukraine!
it's over. Go home. Go.